Jordan in London. The long reign of John Paul II, the Pope who reached out to the world, is in its final hours tonight. The Vatican officially announced that his condition had worsened considerably. In St. Peter's Square, thousands have gathered to pay tribute to his leadership and his example. John Paul's papacy is the third longest in history. He's the first non-Italian pope for nearly 500 years. In Britain and across the globe, prayers are being said for the leader of the world's one billion Roman Catholics. And in other news tonight, President Mugabe's ruling parties declared the winner in Zimbabwe's controversial elections. Binge drinking crackdown, bar staff will face fines if they serve drunk customers. And rescuers find one survivor of the Indonesian earthquake, but hopes fade of saving more. In BBC London news, a rise too far as the congestion charge goes from five to eight pounds. And cleaning up her estate, the North London grandmother taking on the crack dealers. Good evening from Rome and from St. Peter's Square in these final hours of the papacy of John Paul II. Tonight, the Vatican announced that the Pope's health had worsened. His breathing, they said, had become shallow. His heart and kidneys were weakening. His overall condition, according to the official spokesman, was notably compromised. The Pope is being looked after in his private apartments over there in the Vatican. Officials say they are respecting his wish not to return to hospital in this closing phase. First tonight, Jeremy Bowen on the course of the day here in Rome. Tempio dello Spirito Santo, prega per noi. All evening, thousands of Catholics have been gathering in St. Peter's Square to pray and to wait. A sort of peace is settling over the people here. They seem very calm. Everybody knows what's coming next. The Pope's health has been deteriorating for years. All his followers knew that this day would come. But that hasn't made what's happened in the last 24 hours any easier for more than a billion Catholics around the world. At St. John Lateran, another of Rome's great basilicas, Cardinal Camillo Ruini, the vicar of Rome, told worshippers that John Paul is already seeing and touching the Lord. When the Pope dies, it is Ruini's job to tell the people of Rome. Late yesterday evening, when the pilgrims and tourists had left St. Peter's Square, the Vatican made its first announcement that the Pope was seriously ill. It said that a urinary infection had given him a high fever. What it didn't say was that he'd already received the sacrament for the dying. By the morning, more and more pilgrims were coming to St. Peter's. Some of them said they'd been praying all night, and they went on praying for the old dying man in his rooms on the top floor of the Apostolic Palace. Catholics believe that something better lies beyond this life. Perhaps it was time for John Paul to stop fighting. I think he's gone through enough and I think over the last while the public have been demanding too much and like he needs peace and quiet to die in peace, you know. I'm very sad. He's had a, a wonderful life. He's had a wonderful a career as Pope and it's sad to see him going down so quickly but I think he's dying in the manner in which he lived very courageously. On a fine spring day St Peter's is always busy but this was different. The police closed the avenue that leads to the square. Officials from the Rome municipal authorities held what they called an emergency summit to make plans to deal with thousands of mourners. And among the Catholics already here, these were praying with their rosaries, there was a strong sense of change and of loss. It's like losing your father. It's like, yeah, well, we are. We're losing our father, our spiritual father, so in a sense. We're going to be by ourselves in a while and not knowing who's going to come later. The Pope last spoke in public on the day that he left hospital nearly three weeks ago. 
the Pope went home against the advice of his doctors, who believed that hospital was the best place for a man of 84 with an advanced case of Parkinson's disease. A week ago, on Good Friday, live pictures of the Pope praying in his private chapel were broadcast at a religious ceremony at Rome's Colosseum. But he was only filmed from behind because he was breathing with a respirator. The Vatican admitted that he was making a slower than expected recovery from his throat operation. The Pope was last seen in public on Wednesday. He tried to speak, but he couldn't. And a few hours later, the Vatican announced that he was being fed through a tube in his nose. This morning, in a highly emotional news conference, the Pope's spokesman, Joaquin Navarro Vols, said that he'd refused to go back to hospital, even though the infection had developed into septic shock and heart failure. Il Santo Padre, dal primo momento, era stato informato della gravità from the moment the Holy Father was told about the gravity of his situation, he decided to stay in his apartment at the Vatican. A full medical team was there to help him. John Paul asked to be read the Bible's account of Jesus' walk to his crucifixion. Then it became clear that Mr. Navarro Vols was describing the deathbed of the Pope who was elected in 1978. <laughs> I have never seen anything like this in the whole 26 years. The Pope is lucid, extraordinarily serene, even though it is very hard for him to breathe. John Paul's spokesman left the room close to tears. By late this afternoon, neurologists here in Rome who've been following the Pope's decline were in no doubt about what was happening. I would say his conditions uh, would be critical uh, and probably, uh, even though it's difficult to uh, make this statement in a definite way, probably terminal in a uh, uh, few hours or a few days. At Rome's Polish church early this evening, the ambassadors to the Holy See assembled to pray for John Paul. He dominated the spiritual lives of a generation. At the moment, it's for me very difficult to, to, to how to say, to imagine myself that, that the Pope is in such a situation. Because for us, he was such a symbol existing forever, forever. Then, as another night was falling over St. Peter's, the Vatican issued one more bulletin. It said, in effect, that John Paul was dying that the man that Catholics believe is the 264th direct successor of St. Peter had very little time left. Jeremy Bowen, BBC News, at the Vatican. Around the world tonight, Roman Catholic communities and peoples of other faiths, of course, are praying for the Pope as they are still in St. Peter's Square right now. Special masses have been said in cities across Britain with several hundred people attending a special service at London's Westminster Cathedral. Our World Affairs editor, John Simpson, assesses the global response to the news of the Pope's decline. The portrait radiates the strength and confidence of earlier days as Westminster Cathedral holds special prayers for John Paul II. Here, as elsewhere in Britain and the wider world, alongside the sorrow, there seemed to be a kind of serenity among Catholics, an Mary acceptance Mary, that the Pope's the life was ebbing the away. There was the same sense in Liverpool Cathedral. This was news which people have been anticipating for some time now. Yet John Paul II has represented something fixed in people's lives for more than 26 years, a generation. Even older Catholics, this was in Belfast this evening, find it hard to remember the days before 1978, when popes were Italian, scarcely ever left the Vatican, and mostly kept quiet about politics. John Paul II changed all of that. Exceptional, yes. And I think if he does die now, I think he's, he'll leave a great legacy. He defends life from, from inception conception to the grave, you know, and, and he values the dignity of every person. He's been a very good pope, quite conservative, uh, despite appearances, he has been quite conservative, but he's a wonderful man. I think he's a saint, really. 
It's been an extraordinary life, and one which has undoubtedly changed the course of modern history. Many people, in fact, would argue that for a Pole to be elected Pope helped to bring down the entire Soviet empire. But how will history judge him? He's been quite an extraordinary leader. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, there have been, I think, two other popes called the Great, Leo the Great, Gregory the Great. Uh, uh, maybe John Paul would be called uh, Pope John Paul the Great as well because of his extraordinary pontificate. Notre Dame in Paris. Again, the feeling of quiet resignation, the acceptance of the inevitable. All the same, in much of Western Europe, the Pope's later years aroused plenty of hostility. His views on the role of women, on subjects like contraception, on gay issues in particular. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In Washington, another mass for John Paul II. Here in America, too, his views divided people. Yet, for the moment, the judgments have been set aside. Everyone can accept his significance. One who I believe has had in some ways unparalleled impact uh, through his uh, great moral authority, through his willingness to speak out for people in need, through his willingness to speak out for freedom. In the Philippines, poor and overwhelmingly Catholic, the emotion is much more intense. John Paul II was the first pope to pay real attention to the third world. Right around the globe tonight, people understand that a remarkable life is quietly fading away. John Simpson, BBC News. Well, in Poland today, the Pope's native country, of course, thousands of people left work and school to attend church services there. In the city of Krakow, the vigils were especially personal because the people there were praying for the man who'd become their archbishop when the communist regime was at its most powerful. Let's join our correspondent, Alan Little, who's in Krakow tonight. Well, a mood of uh, sombre acceptance has been descending on Krakow tonight. For days now, people have been coming to the public spaces, to the church squares, in a kind of quiet procession to say prayers and pay homage. This, as you say, Hugh, was the place where he was archbishop, the place from where he went to Rome in 1978, not yet knowing he was about to become Pope, so it carries a very special significance here. And in the last couple of hours, the local radio and television have started to play somber music interspersed with the Pope's own words. And it's having a pretty devastating impact here. When the time for mourning comes, they will mourn here with a special intensity and a unique poignancy. It is like a family bereavement. For days, they've kept vigil, waiting for the inevitable. It is a measure not only of the moral authority he commands, but of the extraordinarily intimate affection in which he's held here. It's very sad because he was uh, our, our hope, our, our light in this, in this world. It's, it's really sad because Krakow is really strictly connected with and I think it will be hard for the people to, to get used to such a, such a thing. John Paul II's character was forged in the intense heat of Poland's 20th century tragedy. When the Nazis overran his country, he was just 18. Then, when the communists proclaimed atheism a state doctrine, he chose defiance through the church. When in 1978 that defiance produced a pope from behind the Iron Curtain, the effect was electrifying. He came home as pontiff a year later and millions greeted him. For through the church, the Poles had for 40 years kept alive an alternative sense of who they were, of their national character. Many believe it was this event that signaled the beginning of the end for communism in Europe. Without him, there would still be communism. Communism would have lasted much longer, and so would our problems. He created hope, he woke up the people, the people took up the struggle, and we have a free world now. And this is what they're mourning. Pope John Paul, they believe, bequeaths them a Poland unrecognizable from the one he grew up in. For them, he is more than a spiritual leader. He is the man who gave them back their country. 
So this is what Pope John Paul has come to mean to many Poles. They attribute to him an almost biblical role in history, leading Poland back to what they see as its rightful place among the community of European nations, allowing them to assert a very Western identity. Uh, they see him as the man no less who redeemed and indeed restored their nation. Alan Little uh, in the Krakow, thank you very much indeed. Well, I have to tell you that in Rome tonight there is a, a remarkable atmosphere here. It's solemn, of course. It's pretty silent too, which is unusual in this city. Let me show you what's going on right now in St. Peter's Square. It is a quarter past 11 at night here. Thousands of people have gathered. They're not just Romans. They're not just Italians. Uh, they're from all over the world. They include tourists, of course, but they include people who've come here especially to say their prayers, to pay their respects to the man who's led the Roman Catholic Church for over 26 years and whose papacy is now drawing to a close. It's the third longest papacy in history, which is a remarkable fact that everyone is dwelling on today. With me is Robert Mickens, who's the Vatican correspondent of the Catholic newspaper, The Tablet. Robert, what is your sense of the momentum of events today? Well, Hugh, everything happened kind of quickly, you know, uh, from three weeks of no bulletin of the Pope's health, then all of a sudden we got a bulletin, and then rapidly at uh, 10 o'clock at night we, we had this urgent appeal that all of a sudden the Pope was in grave danger, and then overnight everything's been very quick. People, as you said, were coming in and out of the square. Many of them were just accidental tourists, as it were. Uh, but tonight we've seen this remarkable thing, this uh, overflow of uh, affection really for the Pope I think that Catholic people and Romans as you said who are naturally curious when there's an event like this but really I think people on one hand want to pay respects to this Pope and be a part of this uh, last moment of his life and also be want to be a part of history because this man really probably as much as anyone in our lifetime really put his mark on the history of the world. In the past, at very sensitive times like this, the Vatican has been criticized for the way it's handled the news and the way it disseminates the news. What is your assessment of the way it's being handled right now? Well, I think one of the things they want to do is to prepare people. There's no longer any way that they can keep this news. We know that the Pope is dying. The cardinals have said this. Uh, several cardinals have given uh, reports that, that, that the Pope is dying. And I think that what they want to do is to be as open as they can whilst remaining uh, private and keeping, uh, honoring the Pope's privacy. But um, you're right, I mean, in the past it's not always been so open here in the Vatican, but uh, yeah, this is, it's a solemn moment and uh, so they've had to come out and help prepare people for this. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll be back, of course, in Rome if there's any news uh, before the end of the program. In the meantime, it's back to you, Darren, in London. Hugh, thank you. On to other news now, and President Robert Mugabe's ruling ZANU PF party has been declared the winner of Zimbabwe's parliamentary elections by the country's official counting centre. The opposition movement for democratic change has accused Mr Mugabe of rigging the result. The BBC is banned from reporting from Zimbabwe, so our Africa correspondent Hilary Anderson sent this report from neighbouring South Africa. A massive victory for President Mugabe and hardly a surprise. His supporters were celebrating even before the results were out. It was a humiliating defeat for the opposition. But controversy is raging. Mugabe's opponents want to know what happened to their votes. They didn't even vote. The opposition leader, Morgan Changarai, said the elections had been massively and blatantly rigged. We are deeply disturbed by the fraudulent activities that we have unearthed in one of the constituencies. And we believe it's a pattern that is characteristic of all majority of the constituencies. The electoral register appeared to be riddled with false names. Tens of thousands were turned away from polling stations and there was intimidation in the run-up to voting. Where the opposition did win seats today, there was a mood of defiance. People felt cheated and furious. You must go, Mugabe. But no one's expecting major protests. Zimbabweans have been beaten down. They're poorer now than 30 years ago, and most are just worried about food. Robert Mugabe is 81 years old. These may be the last elections before he retires. 
This victory will ensure his party stays in power for years to come. That'll help secure him from reprisals for dragging his country down. Tonight, Robert Mugabe's party is heading for a landslide victory. If he gets it, it'll make him more powerful than ever. With these elections, Mr. Mugabe has proven once again that he's a master of defying international condemnation and ruling Zimbabwe on his own terms. Hilary Anderson, BBC News in Johannesburg. Bar staff who serve drunk customers will face an on-the-spot fine from next week. The government's announced that the penalty will come into force on Monday, together with an on-the-spot fine for those caught buying alcohol underage. The Conservatives and Liberal Democrats say that's not enough to tackle binge drinking and that the government should delay plans for 24-hour licensing. Richard Bilton reports. <laughs> this is the sort of behaviour the government wants to stop. The drunkenness and confrontation that spills onto our streets every weekend. The police can already give on the spot fines for those who are drunk and disorderly, but from Monday their powers will be extended. Instant punishment to those who fuel binge drinking, the bar owners who sell to drunks. I think it's a really quick way for the police to take action and we've issued over 50,000 notices now up and down the country. Uh, the police welcome them, it saves their time and I think it does help to change behaviour because people think twice if they get a £50 on the spot fine. So more responsibility will now be placed with bars and their staff and there are separate powers that could see the families of underage drinkers being fined. These are just the latest in a series of measures designed to tackle a national problem with drink. But from November, we could have 24-hour licensing. Opposition parties say it's the wider policies that need to be reconsidered. A few extra on-the-spot fines will make little difference. We need far more police on our streets and in our towns and our cities. We need to make sure that policing more appropriately fits uh, local crime situations. And we need to make sure that the police are accountable for what they actually do in those situations. Make the punishment something that matters. Just having to pay 50 quid is something the very rich can do very easily. And quite a lot of other people may forget after a fortnight. On Friday and Saturday nights, many of our town centres are taken over by alcohol. These new powers are about dealing with its short-term impact, but the longer-term issue is our national culture of binge drinking. Richard Bilton, BBC News, Stockton. From today, people who donate sperm and eggs for fertility treatment will no longer have the right to remain anonymous. Children who are conceived from a donation will now be able to find out who their genetic parents are when they reach 18. Jill Higgins reports. Karen and Damien Barnes feel their hopes fading. They're in their mid-40s and desperately want a family. But they need a suitable egg donor. They're worried today's change in the law means even fewer will come forward. It's something I want more than anything in the world. There's hundreds and hundreds of couples all over Britain on waiting lists. That, I mean, ours is the shortest waiting list, but some of them are four and five year waiting lists. And, you know, you, your body clock's ticking. The donor shortage is a problem in this country. At least 1,500 egg donors are needed to meet demand in the UK. But in 2004, there were just 1,100, most from women having fertility treatment themselves. Now, it's just as big a problem with sperm donors. At least 500 are needed, but last year there were just 250. And it's true, the loss of anonymity will put some people off. This donor has children of his own. He wants to help childless couples, but nothing more. You could get somebody to knock on your door um, out of the blue, um, son or a daughter that you've never met before. You have no idea. You can't push them away. You just have to take it on board and there'll be some people just won't be able to cope with that. Hi, Sam. But to young people like Zana Merricks, the change in law is important. She was born okay. from donated Hello. sperm and though she has a loving family, she feels something's missing. To find my donor and, and to know a bit, a bit about his personality and where he's from and what life he's lived, I think would make me feel more whole as a person. This law's too late for Zana, but from today, others will have the right to learn more about who they are. Jill Higgins, BBC News. Great. Hopes of finding any more survivors from the Indonesian earthquake are fading tonight. On the island of Nias, rescue workers found one woman alive. But the aid effort is now concentrating on recovering the dead and helping the survivors. 
Food and medicine is now beginning to arrive by boat on Nias. From there, our special correspondent Ben Brown reports. There isn't much to celebrate on Nias, but this was a rare moment of hope. The rescue of a woman who had been trapped in the rubble here for days, exhausted, traumatized, but alive and well. Tonight, other injured survivors of the earthquake are being evacuated from this island. There are nowhere near enough doctors or nurses to treat them here, so they must be flown to hospitals on the mainland. Three months on from the tsunami, another part of Indonesia now desperately needs help from the rest of the world. Aid is starting to arrive here, but it's painstakingly slow, and getting supplies of food, clothing and shelter to this island is fraught with logistical difficulties. The airport is so tiny that food aid has to come in by sea, but even when it gets here, moving it around Nias is a nightmare. The roads have been torn apart by the earthquake. It's only by motorbike that we've been able to drive on them at all. And there's virtually no fuel on the island. Enormous queues form at the petrol stations here. People squabble and scuffle for what little fuel is left. By contrast, there is a dignified silence as rescue teams work around the clock to free corpses from the rubble where they've been entombed. Body bags have been brought to the island, but not nearly enough for all the dead. Four days on from the disaster, the stench of rotting corpses is overwhelming on what used to be one of Indonesia's paradise islands. Ben Brown, BBC News, Nias. Well, that's all from here for the moment. Now back to Hugh in Rome. Hugh. Darren, thank you very much. What is now clear, Darren, uh, here in Rome tonight is that the thousands of people uh, who've gathered in St. Peter's Square are not going home. They're going to stay there all night. They've been staging vigils all day and they've been lighting their candles and saying their prayers. They're still there now and lots of them have been telling us that they'll be saying their prayers all night, waiting for any news from the Vatican itself. And the Vatican has been telling us tonight that they will indeed be making announcements if any news occurs. We can talk to our correspondent Jeremy Bowen, who's just off St. Peter's Square. Jeremy, all the details we've had about the readings and the prayers at the Pope's bedside, what do we read into the sequence of events and details the Vatican has given us? Partly the Vatican has been trying to prepare the faithful for the death of the Pope. But also, I think, by giving details, they really want people to try to share in it. Uh, they, the, the, the Vatican spokesman has painted a very vivid word picture of the deathbed scene, the Pope being read to uh, from the Bible about Jesus' last moments, his walk to the cross, surrounded by six cardinals who've been his principal uh, collaborators in his project over the years, the faithful archbishop who's been with him since the beginning. A, a, a po Here in Rome tonight is that the thousands of people uh, who've gathered in St. Peter's Square are not going home. They're going to stay there all night. They've been staging vigils all day and they've been lighting their...